good morning. It is Wednesday, December 6, 2023. And yes, this is not Lenny the Legend. It is me filling in. We already got sound. Are you kidding me? All right, let me tell the chat room we have sound. And let's get this party started. Okay, Lenny just went off to get some blood work today. Normal stuff. You know, they won't refill your medications until you uh, agree to give blood. So that's what he's doing. He went to give blood this morning and he should be home any moment. But I do know the sound is good in the chat room. So let me go ahead and say hello to everybody who's joined us today. Danny, Eddie, Laura, say hello to Mary. Robert C., Rotorius, uh, and a couple of guests. The chat room is still filling up. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. Sound is perfect. Thank you, Captain Danny. Eddie, you're bored. I know you're bored. Are you still bored? There was a couple of things that happened yesterday. And um, I'm waiting for a couple people to get to chat so that I can bring up their tidbits. But until then, let me go ahead and tell you that MLB free agency in general is boring. All right? Now, somebody brought up on X about spicing it up a little bit, saying that, you know, MLB is changing other rules to make the game more exciting, so why not spice up free agency a little bit? It's just, it is boring, and I got a text yesterday from Mal Pal who said, the highlight of the meetings so far, oh shoot, which one was it? It was it was a pretty ridiculous one. Let me see what he said. Just a second here. He said, uh, Kirby Yates signing with the Rangers is the top story of the winter meetings. And then he proceeded to put Z's as if he was sleeping. I get it. Eddie, anyways, I'm mostly speaking to you here. I know how bored you're getting. You made some comments yesterday in the chat room that said... Let's get this show on the road. And yes, I agree. It can be boring, but it's not like it's a condensed amount of time, you know? Otani clearly is the top of everybody's mind right now, not only because he is probably the most exciting baseball player to ever reach an open market, but because the fact that Otani is going to set the tone for other teams. I mean... Between Otani and Yamamoto, this is holding up a lot of other signings. A lot of potential trades are being based on this market. And allow, you know, um, you talk about the free agency. I said it's not a condensed period of time here. Uh, By allowing such a a long, open-ended window for free agency, everything does wait on a couple players, and people do get bored of the the ridiculous speculation that goes on. If they ended the free agency by December 31st, you'd hear about all kinds of uh, deals going on at the meetings, and Otani would be there as well. And uh, that, I mean, you know, I agree with the idea that You know, you're changing other things to make baseball more exciting. Baseball to us is exciting all season, but I get how it does kind of linger on and on and it waits for certain players to be signed. And, you know, it all it all depends on when they get signed, how much excitement there is. I do see an opportunity to perhaps make the free agency a little shorter condensed than it is now. Good morning to Zelmo. Good morning to you all. Good morning to Eddie Heckman, Teresa, DK Louche, Chris and Debbie Gallo, Methical, Robert C. Rotorius, Timothy Hooker is here. Lenny will be happy to see you, Timothy, and Zelmo and Tony. Now, the Cubbies' optimism of landing Shohei Otani, they say, has significantly waned. That's according to a high ranking executive. Now, the Dodgers, the Blue Jays, the Angels, the Giants seem to be the most likely finalists in the Otani race going on here. According to John Heyman, Otani has expressed interest in the Dodgers and the Jays, which 
once again, just baffles my brain. He says this comes from a clubhouse source. Okay, but Otani's not expressing interest in anybody. And that I guarantee because his agent would have nothing of the sort. So this idea that Otani has expressed interest in the Dodgers and the Blue Jays, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it is what it is. I'm just telling you what John Heyman is reporting. Now, if Malpal was here, that'd be great. Merrill is here. Mitchell is here. Great to see the both of you. Separated by Mythical, sitting in the middle. We love the hearts and brothers. Thanks for joining us today. King App. Welcome aboard, King Hap. Punching and beating up the Grinch who stole Christmas. He posted that in the chat room. Apparently, King Haps, from what I hear, all the rumors have it, that your show last night, the open forum situation where you let everybody just ask the questions that they want. I heard it went great. Good job, King Hap. Now, you can always listen to the Hapster on Twitch, Happy Hour SC. Uh, tonight, 7.30, they do the happy hour, which is great fun. Lots of friends and family over there. Of course, you can always listen here, too, and we really appreciate the Happy Hour Social Club being part of our little network here at Lenny Melnick Fantasy Sports, but the chat room is always full over there. You can get involved, okay, with games. They play marbles. They give away all kinds of great swag, merch, whatever you want to call it. That show tonight, happy hour, starts at 7.30. And, of course, they do a show every Wednesday and Thursday over at Twitch. You can see that they do some specials on Tuesday nights when they have a good interview or they want to do something extra for the holidays, which last night they did. All kinds of questions. I heard it went great. Thanks for being around, King Hapster. We love you. All right. Now. They say, John Heyman says, according to a clubhouse source, Otani expressed interest in Dodgers and Jays during the season. And they are two prominent teams in the final five, okay, in the Otani sweepstakes. However, I would be hesitant to believe that there's only five teams, although there's only probably five teams in baseball that can actually afford it or are willing to take the chance on such a long, expensive contract. Eduardo Rodriguez. All right, spotted in Nashville. Holy moly. Let the games begin. Anyway, Eduardo Rodriguez's free agent market is moving quickly and he could reach a decision even before Otani gets signed. Eduardo is in Nashville and has had multiple in-person meetings with teams, according to John Heyman. Let's talk about Yamamoto before we get to the Alex Verdugo trade, which I knew you'd love, King Hap. I mean, does it remind you a little bit? I know this is probably not exactly the same, but it reminded me immediately of how, as a Red Sox fan at the time, when the Yankees decided to get Johnny Damon, and we knew, I mean, Johnny Damon was a special part of the Yankees' 2004 team. He then got traded a couple years later to the Yankees. The Red Sox fans were not as sad as one might expect, and we cheered when he went to the Yankees, and he just stunk. Like, he was not good for them at all. They got sucked into some long-ass contract, and I think the Red Sox fans were sorry to see Johnny Damon go, but they also knew that his contract was going to crush them in the long run, and they were okay with it. Now you see a guy like Verdugo go into the Yankees. I mean... The only reason, I guess, I thought about Johnny Damon is because I think that the Red Sox fans feel the same way about Verdugo. They're fine with the Yankees getting him. He hasn't really done much for the Red Sox to begin with. But you can't forget the fact that Verdugo is always going to be sour grapes for Red Sox fans who loved their boy Mookie. And everybody loved Mookie. But some people could never get over the fact that they got rid of Mookie and this is who replaced him, Verdugo. He never had a chance with the Red Sox fans as far as being a fan favorite. Just because of that. 
yes, Damon was a better player than Verdugo, but it's maybe it's maybe it just brought up Johnny Damon in my mind because the Yankees and the Red Sox very rarely ever make trades, and so that was the first one that came to mind. Anyway, we're going to talk about the Verdugo thing later. Boston Paul sent me the note last night. Um, Yamamoto, though, first, okay? Yamamoto. You got Yoshinobu Yamamoto. According to sources, all right, the Red Sox top priorities right now include Yamamoto, okay? He's expected to sign after Otani and before the end of the month. Expected whatever, okay? That's, <laughs> I don't know. These are all opinions. So a writer, one of these writers, ran into an American League executive on Monday, and he said, like all conversations at the winter meetings, the exchange quickly turned into a bargaining session. He says, there you trade in news updates. So the writer said that the executive laughed and said it's early before delivering the nugget that he was looking for which is that the Yankees are telling people they are ahead of the pack on the Yamamoto talks like way ahead he says and off the executive went all right but here's the thing the Yankees aren't alone in believing that they've got Yamamoto's attention, the Giants are making the same claim after a recent Zoom meeting with the agent of Yamamoto. His name is Joel Wolf. So be careful taking the Yankees' claim at face value that they're ahead in the in the bids for Yamamoto. Also, Yes, the Yankees have the money to pay Yamamoto, but the Giants and several other teams do, notably the Dodgers, who the Dodgers apparently is one of Yamamoto's childhood teams. He loved following the Dodgers as a young player. That's the rumor. But is it the Yankees brand that might be the difference maker here? They are having a one-on-one. It's scheduled with Yamamoto next week, and it will be like recruiting on steroids. Every advantage will be leveraged like the season depends on it because it kind of does. I mean, it's not just that the Yankees need a guy like Soto, but they also still need pitching pretty desperately. The Yankees are going to use Hideki Matsui. Okay, a fellow Japanese icon, we all remember him, to attest to the warm welcome that he received from the Yankees fans. Also, Yamamoto would be the only Japanese player on next year's roster, but Matsui's job would be to ease any fears of the big, loud stadium, okay, in the Bronx. The Yankees can also point to uh, Masahiro Tanaka, Right, He had good success during his eight-year run in pinstripes. He pitched for them between 2014 and 2020. And like Yamamoto is today, Tanaka was 25 when he first arrived in the United States, and he was an instant success, posting a 13-5 and record with the 277 ERA in his first season. Good morning to Boston, Paul. I saved the Verdugo talk until you got here. Also, I like the fact that Chris from Cambridge comes in and does the work to share a birthday with us every day. Today is two-time All-Star, former Yankee sensation Gary Ward, 70th birthday. So happy birthday to Gary Ward. And we just happen to be talking about the Yankees anyway, right? So thank you to Chris from Cambridge for putting those in every morning. It can't always be a great player, but I kind of like it. I think it brings something different, and it's a little fun. All right, now, I told you Yamamoto's 25. Tanaka was 25 when he first arrived in the United States. And unlike a lot of these guys that come over from other countries, he was an instant success, 13-5 and record. 277 ERA in his first season. Now that they're saying anyway that that should prove to Yamamoto that A, foreign players don't need a break in period in the major leagues if they show up with elite stuff. Now, whether or not you agree with that, it's not my opinion. This is the opinion of someone else. I tend to disagree a little bit 
it doesn't matter how good your stuff is, okay? It's still a very big ordeal to adjust to a new culture and especially with all the eyes on you everybody's expecting you to pitch great the one thing that they say about Yamamoto that's different from Tanaka is that he loves the spotlight okay they say that the personality is the biggest different from Tanaka according to Yamamoto's friends Yamamoto loves the spotlight. He's unafraid of stardom's burdens. He's intrigued by the Yankees' history and prestige. Now, we don't know if those factors will deliver Yamamoto into Hal Steinbrenner's arms, all right? But look at his numbers. In the past seven seasons with the Oryx Buffaloes, Yamamoto has recorded a 182 ERA with 922 strikeouts in 897 innings. Just as impressively, he's only walked 206. He's got a good velocity. His average fastball velocity sits about 92 to 95, which we love, right? It keeps a player healthy longer. But he does, he can get up to 99. I'm not saying he doesn't throw 99. That's his max, which is good. That's great that you can once in a while throw 99 as long as you're not out there throwing it like that every time, trying to throw your arm out with every pitch. He's got very good movement, sink, cut, run, all on his four seam. Also, he's got a great curveball and a swing and miss splitter. He's got three good pitches that he could use. Now, you talk about his command and control and stuff like that. Just remember, he struck out 922 and he walked 206. So there you go. Let me check up on the chat room now. Everybody is just talking away in the chat room, which we absolutely love. Thank you for joining us. You can always join us live in chat. Lenny Melnick, fantasysports.com forward slash live every day, 9 a.m. Be there. Be square, be round, be whatever shape you want to be in our chat room. We like everybody. All right. Now, moving on here. <laughs> Yamamoto is looking for a payout of $250 million. Him and his agent, Wolf, are waiting patiently while Tim's teams bid themselves into a stupor. How much the Yankees are willing to spend really depends on whether they acquire Juan Soto and the 500 plus million he's seeking. I guess you could say that sequencing does matter here. Not Maybe not even Steinbrenner can pay both Soto and Yamamoto. I don't know if that's true, but they say that they're not going to do both. I don't know if that's true. Soto and Yamamoto. And I'll tell you one thing that I can that I can tell you. If it was their dad, okay, he could do it. No doubt about it. Their dad could spend it. So can or won't? Is that the question? The Yankees, in my opinion, would be a much better team next year. And I I talk about, you know, are the Yankees willing to go get Soto if getting Soto is not going to be the difference from them making the playoffs or not? To me, any team that decides to trade a bunch of prospects for a one-year rental with Soto needs to know that Soto will give them the best chance to win now, right? Well, the Yankees have other problems, right? The Yankees need pitching. So, If they got Soto and Yamamoto, it would really piss off Dodgers fans, which I love, okay? But those two could carry the Yankees right back to the postseason. There's a big difference between what they need and what they can realistically afford or what they're realistically willing to spend. These young kids, Steinbrenners, are not as, I should say, they're more greedy than their dad was with the money. So flip a coin. Soto solves so many problems for Aaron Boone's anemic lineup. Now, a lot of you will be saying to yourselves, well, what about Verdugo? They just got Verdugo. Does that make them not want to get Soto now? They don't need Soto now? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, You got to kind of ask yourself, too, why the Yankees refuse to surrender Michael King, okay, to the Padres 
in the trade talks for Soto? And why is Clark Schmidt being offered instead? Well, obviously, Clark Schmidt is, is, well, let's talk about these. Here's why. The front office is lingering doubt about Carlos Rodon and Nestor Cortez both ended the season horribly. Carlos Rodon lost seven miles an hour off his fastball in his final start of the season. That that is on top of the fact that his final start, right? His final start of the season boosted his ERA from 574 to 685 in one start, okay? He did put quality starts together in his previous two outings. We're talking about Rodon here, but he allowed all eight batters he faced to reach base in his last start of the season. He ended the season with a 685 ERA, 3 and 8, okay? That's horrible. Plus, on top of that, Rodon allowed right-handed batters to hit 274 off of him, and he allowed 2.10 home runs per nine innings, which is disgusting, okay? It's horrible. This guy has never been the type to allow so many home runs, not even close, okay? Now, you look at what he did in San Francisco when he... In 2022, he pitched 178 innings, okay? He allowed .61 home runs in nine innings. Now, I got to mention that there's a huge difference in ballparks between the Giants and the Yankees. Obviously, this was not a great idea to bring Carlos Rodon, but if you were just basing it off of what he did in San Francisco, which you shouldn't because he spent the prior six years in Chicago, and although he had a couple good seasons, it was not ever... Look, Carlos Rodon strikes out a lot of batters. We know that. It was like the... with with Bauer. We never knew if he was going to break out for sure. This was before his Cy Young award. Bauer, we knew, would strike out batters, just like Rodon. You know what you're getting for sure. His ERA is, you never know what you're going to get with his ERA, but you knew that Carlos Rodon was going to strike out a couple hundred batters, and that is what fantasy people relied on, right? Now, he's still striking out batters. In fact, this past season, he struck out nine batters per nine innings. But this guy, you know, we've seen him strike out 12, 13 batters per nine innings over the past couple seasons. And uh, he finished the season horribly last year. Now, we'll see what happens heading into next year. But this is clearly one of the reasons why Schmidt and Michael King are not really... You know, the the Yankees are hesitant to deal these guys for Soto, right? Now, you talk about Nestor Cortez was on the injured list to end the season. He ended the season on the injured list for the second time with the same shoulder problem. And you have to ask yourself, okay, that's not good. Now, his last start was on August 5th of last year. So he, like I said, he ended the season on a bad note. But as far as his stats overall for last year, 63 innings pitch total, 497 ERA. Now, you know this guy is another one. This is another strikeout king. He will strike out batters for sure. You got that? That's a guarantee. But between Cortez and Rodon, their ground ball rate was horrific. You will never be a good pitcher in Yankee Stadium if you cannot induce more than... 26.3% ground balls for Nestor. No, that, yeah, that's Nestor. 26.3% ground ball. Rodon, 27.1% ground ball. Ground ball is a good stat to look at. I know all these fantasy experts have all kinds of other more, um, Difficult formulas for you to look at and all kinds of new stuff coming out all the time. But you can tell straight up if a guy is not inducing ground balls, he is inducing fly balls and he is allowing the ball to leave the ballpark. So when you look at stats for a baseball, a pitcher, it's always good to pay attention to the ground balls, even if you're not using Mal Pal's famous formula, right? So... 
You got Clark Schmidt, who ended the season with a 4.64 ERA overall, but he did have a good stretch where he had 14 starts, okay, between May 25th and August 8th, where he posted a 6-2 and record with a 3.09 ERA, a 107 whip, 56 strikeouts, and 15 walks in 70 innings. However... Over the last five starts of the season, from September on, 24 and two-thirds innings, his ERA was 5'11", with a 142 whip, which can tell you right away that he's walking way too many batters, okay? And his strikeout per nine to finish the season, 5.8 per nine innings. That's no bueno. Good morning to the turd. Welcome to turd. turd <laughs> He's on a very boring work trip. I hope I can spice it up for you, King Turd. Now, rebuilding the offense for the Yankees might have to wait until 2025 if the Padres don't lower their asking price. Why would they lower their asking price? They don't need to. But Steinbrenner's promise of big changes this winter appears less and less likely. General Manager Brian Cashman and Aaron Boone are both returning, but... They are trying right now very hard to get Yamamoto, just like the Red Sox are trying to get Yamamoto. And they are going to marshal all their forces for an old-fashioned full-court press, the same recruiting pitch they used to land Tanaka in 2014, Garrett Cole in 2020, and Rodon a year ago. So you expect them to show Yamamoto all of... I hope they don't take him into Manhattan. He'll never come back. Free agent reliever Kirby Yates in agreement with Rangers on a one-year contract, according to The Athletic. He's 36 years old. Okay. His birthday, he will turn 37 in March. He had a 3-2-8 ERA last year with 80 strikeouts over 60 and a third innings for Atlanta. He did get five saves along the way, but don't get your hopes up, fantasy managers, because he projects to fill a setup role with the Rangers, and he's 37. So, yes, he might get one. Yes, he might get a couple. Uh, King Turd, our resident Rangers insider, says he'll take Yates for free. Tampa Bay re-signed Chris Davinsky to a one-year, $1.1 million contract on Tuesday with a $2 million club option for 2025. He had a 4.46 ERA in 42 and a third innings between the Angels and the Rays last year, but he racked up 42 strikeouts and he only walked 11. He's 33 years old. He owns a career 378 ERA in 373 and a third total big league frames and returns to Tampa Bay as a middle reliever. Now, according to Bob Nightingale earlier in the day, the Cubbies were talking about perhaps trading Christopher Morell to the Rays for Tyler Glass now. Now, you know Christopher Morell is 24 years old. He will turn 25 in July, in June. He's never now they now this is interesting because just a couple weeks ago the Cubbies president of baseball operations whose name is Jed Hoyer he said to reporters that Christopher Morel was going to be playing first base in winter ball this year. Now Morel up till this winter ball situation he has never appeared in a game at first base at any level of professional baseball but the Cubbies are hoping that he might take well to the position and be an option for them next year. You know he spent most of his time at designated hitter last year or he finished the season at designated hitter. So here's the thing. He was horrible defensively, but we don't care about defense in fantasy baseball. We care about at-bats. We care about the stats you put up as an offensive player. And I will tell you this. Let's say they put him at first base next year, okay? Let me tell you what the position eligibility is for Christopher Morrell heading into next year. 
If your position requirements in your league are 20 games at a position, he will qualify at only outfielder to start the season. If your position requirements are 15 games, he qualifies at second base and outfield to start the season. And if you're in Yahoo, he qualifies as second, third, and outfield. And if you consider the fact that the Cubs are saying that they're going to play him at first base, you got a guy who, after five games of play, will be in Yahoo. He will qualify at first, second, third, and outfielder. You can't get better position eligibility than that. But as I mentioned, if your requirements are 20 games, he will qualify at outfield. And if your requirements are 15 games, he'll qualify at second and outfield. You'll get first base eligibility. But that, to me, I, I think, you know, it, it was just a couple weeks ago that they called, that they told reporters that he was going to be playing first base because he basically sucks defensively. And that's why they put him at DH eventually because he can't, He's not good. So he's kind of like uh, Wilmer Flores in that regard. He plays everywhere. He just doesn't play everywhere any good. He's average, but that doesn't matter again. So I do not believe that the uh, Cubbies are willing to trade Christopher Morrell for a one-year rental in Tyler Glass now. Christopher Morrell, as I mentioned, is still only 24 years old. We know he can hit for power. Can he ever fix his 31% strikeout rate? That could be a question, right, that will affect him in the future. But he just hits with a lot of power, and you can rely on that in fantasy, and the Cubbies can rely on that too. They're going to try him out at first base, but they're still going to get him in the lineup. And, you know, he was born and raised here. He's just just so, um, I just don't see, okay? I, I, that's just me. I do not see the Cubbies trading Christopher Morrell for Glass now, even though Glass now could be excellent, okay, next year for sure. Good morning to Big Al on the Prowl. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard, my friend, okay? The Angels bolstered their bullpen. They signed Luis Garcia to a one-year $4.25 million contract. He spent the past two seasons with the Padres. He had a 3.73 ERA and a 1.30 whip over two seasons in San Diego. And he's now going to help bolster an Angels bullpen. And when I say bolster, I only mean that because it's got to be better than the 4.88 ERA last season, which was the fifth worst in baseball. Okay, Luis is, good morning to Leonard. He's home. Why are your pants falling off? He's got too much stuff in his pockets. All right, Leonard, glad to see you home. All right, it has to be better than the 4AA ERA last season. He's 36 years old. He had one save and six holds during his first time with the Angels in 2019, but he may be used more often in high leverage situations next season, given the lack of depth in the Los Angeles Angels bullpen. Again, this is not a closer. This is not a fantasy guy. I'm just telling you the update. Now, Malpal brought up yesterday in chat, if you could believe it, okay, he said straight up that Marco Gonzalez would be a great fit for the Pirates. You know, I questioned it at the time, but I didn't say anything to him. I wish he would have told us why he thought that. It was just a strange thing to say without any reason. But he is now with the Pirates. You could think of Malpal as our crystal ball, okay? But the lefty, Marco Gonzalez, he's now... You know, he was just recently traded to the Braves. He was there for less than 48 hours. He came over in the Jared Kalenic trade. Now he is leaving Atlanta and headed for the Pirates. How do you feel about that, Tommy Johnson? Now, Atlanta is still going to pay part of his $12 million salary, but... He's 31 years old. He's got a forearm issue right now. He's set to be back February 1st. We know what Marco Gonzalez is, kind of. 
you have to remember he's played the majority of his career in Seattle, a pitcher's ballpark, by the way, and he has always been kind of an innings workhorse, you know, with uh, Marco Gonzalez here. Um, he used to strike out quite a bit of batters per nine, but now his strikeouts per nine are horrible. He left Seattle last year with the six strikeouts per nine innings. Still, he does get quite a bit of ground balls. He's okay. Also, and this is interesting too, because we talk about the Yankees uh, getting Verdugo from the Red Sox. And I just want to throw this out there real quick. Just as Marco Gonzalez was used as a new, basically they acquired Gonzalez and then immediately traded him to the Pirates for some prospects. You say to yourself now, the Yankees and the Red Sox finally made a trade with each other. The seventh trade in the last 50 years between these two teams. Alex Verdugo went to the Yankees for pitching prospects Richard Fitz, Greg Weissert, and Nicholas Judis. With trade talk, now they're talking about, remember, they say that the trade talks between the Yankees and Padres regarding Juan Soto have stalled. Now, New York ensures the addition of a left-handed outfielder bat. Verdugo hit 264 with a 324 on base percentage, 13 homers, and 54 RBIs last season, 602 plate appearances. He really does figure to see regular at-bats versus at least right-handed pitchers since he put up an 806 OPS against righties last See across the last three seasons. Now he is a lefty, so of course he fits in well at Yankee Stadium. But last year he played exclusively right field, and the Yankees needed a left fielder, center fielder. So, is it possible that we see a Verdugo flip to another team? Maybe they acquired Verdugo just to get some more leverage so they could get Soto. I don't know, but this is according to John Heyman and, he, and Jim Bowden. No, John Heyman says that Juan Soto or Cody Bellinger is still in play for the Yankees, even after Verdugo deal. If it's Soto, Judge would presumably play center field, and the Yankees are still very much in on Juan Soto, according to John Heyman. Now, Jim Bowden also points out that you shouldn't be surprised if the Yankees try to spin Verdugo in a package with King and Thorpe to the Padres to try to get Juan Soto. Obviously, this is the most notable deal between the Yankees and the Red Sox since at least 2014 when they traded uh, Stephen Drew to the Yankees for Kelly Johnson to the Red Sox at the deadline. I love to see that Boston Red Sox also are interested in Lourdes Gurriel Jr. I will tell you one thing about Lourdes Gurriel. He's great. And he's great in fantasy too, especially for the price that you'll have to pay, even though I can't be sure about that. I haven't done any drafting yet this year. Agent Scott Boris uh, said at the GM meetings that nobody was attracting attention by more teams than Korean MVP Eric Fetty. He did sign Eric. He got Fetty signed, okay, to a two-year, $15 million contract with the White Sox, which to me is impossible, but he did it. Leave it to Scott Boris, right? Okay. John Morrow C. says that you, Lucas Giolito is drawing interest from the Dodgers, the Mets, the Red Sox, the Diamondbacks, and the Royals. And that the Yamamoto and Otani markets will impact Giolito's destination. Giolito stunk it up last year, so whatever team gets him has, a, has an opportunity to get this guy back on track. He posted a 4.88 ERA this year while tying for a league best 33 start. So one thing you can guarantee from Giolito is that you will get some innings out of this kid. Is he a kid? No, he's not a kid. Okay. Now, draft lottery results. 
The Guardians get to pick first after winning the MLB Draft Lottery, and they will select first next year in the MLB Draft. This will be the very first time Cleveland picks number one overall in the MLB Draft. They have picked second overall five times in their history. Number two pick goes to the Reds. Three, the Rockies. Four, the Athletics. Five, and five, the White Sox. The Diamondbacks got screwed because Corbin Carroll did so good. The Diamondbacks got the 31st pick of the draft as a result of Corbin Carroll winning the National League Rookie of the Year Award. Now, if that seems sucky, that's because it is sucky. Sarah Langs lets us know she's not sucky. The fewest games played to 40-plus homers and 15-plus stolen bases in a season. You guys, this is the trivia of the day. Which player... Two of the top three are still active hitters. Which player took the fewest games in a season to get to 40 home runs and 15 stolen bases? It happened in in 2019. The batter took only 109 games to get 40 homers and 15 stolen bases. The number two is Ken Griffey Jr. It took him 111 games in 1996. And number three on the list was 2023. Shohei Otani took him 112 games to get to 40 homers and 15 stolen bases. But who did this in 2019? It took him the least number of games of any player in baseball history to hit 40 bombs and 15 stolen bases in a season. Eddie Heckman chimes in and says he doesn't know. All right, Eddie. Am I boring you? Malpel says, are we interested in Fetty? Absolutely not. Not for me. But by all means, tell me if you are. Ken Rosenthal says, the Astros are in agreement with uh, free agent catcher Victor Caratini. Also, Eddie, this is for you. So pull up your big boy pants now. The Orioles have been seriously engaged with free agent reliever Craig Kimbrell. Baltimore will be without a star closer, you know, Felix Batista next season because he had Tommy John surgery. Love you, Eddie. Yes, Leonard Donaldson. Everybody should know this one. It was only in 2019. This guy is still playing. I should give you a hint or no. Don't let me forget to tell you the answer before I go. Um... If the Orioles sign Kimbrel, he could see some saves and or he could be the setup guy for Cano, who was also excellent. Danny says Acuna. No, it was not Acuna. Zelmo gets it. Smarty pants. Zelmo. Zelmo wins. The genius of the day. Christian Yelich took the fewest number of games to get there. Right? In baseball history. What happened to him after that? We'll not know. Joe Ross, si- Joe Ross signed a deal with the Brewers. One year, $1.75 million with incentives. Now, Joe Ross has thrown a combined 17 innings over the last two seasons. And none of them have been in the majors. He had two Tommy John surgeries. But that did not stop the Brewers from handing him a major league deal in hopes that he's healthy and ready to contribute next year. I wouldn't count on this guy for anything more than to be a, 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 a an effector, if you will. He's 30 years old. He has a career 426 ERA, 403 strikeouts, 141 walks, over 443 innings at the big league level. Now, if the Cub, now this is according to John Heyman at New York Post Sports, if the Cubbies fall out of Otani sweepstakes. It's a greater chance that they continue to look closely at Cody Bellinger, Matt Chapman, and Reese Hoskins. I would say you don't need all three of those guys, but clearly one would do. I hope the Cubbies, by all means, get Cody Bellinger. He seemed to be the perfect fit over there, but he's going to cost some money. The Reds have engaged with conversations over 
uh, with the White Sox over Dylan Cease, right? This is according to the Cincinnati Inquirer beat writer, Gordon Wittenmeyer. He talks about Cease being 28 this month. He's been among the most discussed trade targets of the offseason so far. The Chicago general manager, Chris Getz, suggested yesterday that there's no club in the majors without at least some level of interest in Dylan Cease. He also pointed out that there's nothing concrete developing from the discussion so far, but the fit of Dylan Cease to the Reds, it does make sense. Dylan Cease ended the season on a low note, and I would, you know, the poor White Sox, they're in a position where, you know, I always say don't trade a guy at his lowest value, but... um, Dylan C's four five eight ERA last year three seven two FIP. His, I'll tell you right now that not only is his FIP clearly lower than his ERA, but you look at the reasons why, and you'll see. You know, the batting average on balls in play was three thirty, which is crazy high. Okay, and his sixty nine point four percent strand rate unusually low both of these two things and the fact that his FIP is 372 indicate there's been some bad luck baked into these results that you're seeing kind of like Spencer Strider this year 2022 Dylan Cease had a 220 ERA with 310 FIP he struck out 30 percent of batters that he faced since 2021 his 3.54 ERA in 97 starts, struck out 29.8% of batter's face and walked 10%. The Reds' rotation last year was 5-4-3 ERA, bottom three in the majors, only ahead of Oakland A's and Colorado Rockies. Now, the Reds do have an interesting group of young starters, headlined by Hunter Green, but you have Andrew Abbott, who we talked about in the chat room yesterday, Graham Ashcraft, Nick Lodolo, Brandon Williamson, and Connor Phillips. They also recently signed a couple relievers, including Nick Martinez. No, well, I would say he's not a reliever. He might be in their rotation. I would say he is going to be in their rotation, but they did get another reliever who does not induce hardly any ground balls, which was very surprising, right? Anyway, let's talk about Bauer, and then you're done. All right, so... According to reports, John Heyman says that the Yokohama Bay Stars are trying to get Trevor Bauer to come back and pitch for them, okay? But in the meantime, Bauer's agents, uh, Rachel Luba and John Federoff, are in Tennessee meeting with MLB teams right now. And I just, I thought that was good. Of course, Daniel posted that in the chat room earlier this morning, but... You all know how I feel. I I swear, yesterday I see one of these fantasy experts, okay, that I know very well and we've been friends in the past. I don't think he talks to me anymore, but that's another subject. He posts on Twitter or X that he says, note to self, skip round 24. And then he shows a picture of the players available in round 24, okay? James Paxton, Trevor Bauer, Anthony Rendon, and Brendan Rodgers. He says, note to self, skip round 24. So then, of course, I'm interested in what the people on X have to say to that. Uh, Are any of these people going to at least bring his name up? I mean, you're in round 24 in your fantasy draft, and you're just going to ignore Trevor Bauer's name again, right? And that's how they work. So according to all of these people that commented, not one person even mentioned Bauer. It's as if he's dead, okay? They talk about Rendon, right? They talk about uh, Paxton, how he might be okay in a, for a couple months of the season, but nobody, not one person, even brings up Bauer. So, and here's the thing. Whether you like him or not, you can hate the guy fine. But I I swear, this is the thing. Once the truth about Bauer, assault accusations were forced down everybody's throat, whether you wanted to hear it or not, you figured out more to the story about Bauer's accuser. Believe her, believe whoever you want, but... 
you would think that once this information came out about Bauer and how good he did pitching in Japan, you would think they would at least stop ignoring him as a potential fantasy asset. I mean, these are people that are supposed to be trying to help you win your league and they're treating Bauer as if he doesn't exist because they would rather sit there and virtue signal to their friends about what a good person they are because they don't like women beaters. Even though they all drafted Ozuna, they all draft these other women beaters, but because Bauer never admitted that he did it, in fact, from day one, he said, I did not assault this woman. He's shown all kinds of text messages about how these two planned their rendezvous, how she came to his house from San Diego more than once. She wanted it harder and blah, blah, blah. You know, this is a personal life between somebody and two grown adults. But you'll sit there and you'll draft Ozuna. Why? Because he towed the line and he admitted that he beat his wife only because it was caught on camera and the guy went to jail. So of course he's going to have to say to MLB that he did it because MLB does not take kindly to people who are being accused of this kind of conduct and they don't admit that they did anything wrong because with MLB... The domestic violence uh, rules in MLB say, you know, we will work out uh, classes, we'll send you to therapy, you could go to anger management, you could do all these things to work on your marriage, and then we're going to cut your suspension down. That's great. That means you're giving people a chance to redeem themselves for making a huge mistake in their life. Now, with Bauer, nobody wants to do that. None of these fantasy so-called experts are going to do that for him because they're too busy shaming and hating and canceling anybody that doesn't tow their ideological mindset, which, by the way, is a nightmare, okay? I say... If you ignore Trevor Bauer completely because you don't like the guy, then you are not giving yourself the best chance to win fantasy. If it is round 24 and this guy's name comes up next to Paxton and Brendan Rogers, okay, I would suggest putting your personal thoughts about whether you got, you like this guy personally or not and consider the fact that when he comes back to the United States, he is going to have a chip on his shoulder that is so huge, he already walks around with the chip on his shoulder and always has. But he has more to prove than any player in baseball history. And whether or not he does great, I can't guarantee that. I can't guarantee that he'll even get a job in the woke world that we live in. But... If he does, you are getting a pitcher that is a potential Cy Young guy in round 24. But don't forget that he exists, okay? That's my, uh, that's why, that's my theory. Thank you to everybody who joined me today. Leonard is back from his blood work and everything is going well. I hope you all have a great day and we will see you back tomorrow. Don't forget to join Happy Hour tonight at 730 and that's it.